For the last three Mystery Mondays on this channel, we have been discussing disappearances in the Bennington Triangle of Vermont. And today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be discussing the fourth case. This case is a little bit hard because it does involve a child. But before we go any further, you know what to do. Please hit that subscribe button and give us a like. As always, a very, very special thank you to all of our patrons and our producers. Without you, we truly could not do what we do. And I personally am entirely grateful and appreciative of you. If you would like to join our Patreon community, there is a link down in the description box below. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce, and today on Mystery Monday, we are going to be talking about the vanishing of Paul Jepson. of southwestern Vermont, known as the Bennington Triangle, has a long and complicated history. If you remember from our previous three Monday Mysteries, we spoke about a lot of the folklore involving the Glastonbury Mountain within the Bennington Triangle. Indeed, the nefarious history of this area goes as far back as legends spoken about by the Native Americans. If you missed those three parts, there are links to those three parts down in the description box below. The Bennington Triangle was also part of the American Revolution with the Battle of Bennington happening on the 16th of August, 1777. Now, if you watched our previous three episodes on the Bennington Triangle, then you know that we are covering five different cases of people vanishing in this area. These cases range from 1945 to 1950. The Jepson family had a farm at the base of the Glastonbury Mountain. The family farm was quite large and required a truck for the family members to get around the farm to complete their daily chores. On the evening of the 12th of November of 1950, Margaret Jepson was going to head out to the pigsty to do her daily feeding of the pigs. Her eight-year-old son, Paul Jepson, decided that he wanted to tag along with his mother. Paul jumped into the passenger side of the truck, and together, Paul and his mother, Margaret, drove all the way down to the pigs to do the evening feeding. Now, it has been 71 years since little Paul's disappearance. And given that so much time has passed, it is possible that some of the details of his disappearance might be a little bit skewed. But from what I can find, it seems that Paul's mother parked her truck right beside the pigsty. Little Paul stayed in the truck. Now, again, this was the evening of November 12th up in Vermont it would have been quite chilly. And so I can understand why a mother would want her small child just to stay in the car while she went about and fed the pigs. Now it's noted that, again, the truck was very close to the pigsty, so close that Margaret could probably see the truck out of her peripheral vision. And remember, this is a farm. This is their farm. This is their property. It's quiet. It's not like she wouldn't have heard a door opening or a scream or any kind of unsettling commotion coming from her vehicle. It took Margaret about an hour to finish her chore of feeding the pigs. And once she was done, she headed back to the truck, only to find that Paul was not in the passenger side seat. Now again, from what I understand, this was really peculiar because, as I said, Margaret could see the truck the whole time. Granted, her focus wasn't on the truck, it was on feeding the pigs, but again, the truck was there. It was, it was in her peripheral vision. And I know many, many mothers today would probably do the same thing that Margaret did, seeing that they still kind of had their eye on their child. And as I said, what on this family farm, this quiet family farm, was gonna hurt Paul without her noticing since the truck was so close. Needless to say, Margaret at first was very baffled and confused. Where could Paul have gone? 
but he was an eight-year-old, and, and maybe it was possible that she didn't hear him open the car door. So she figured that little Paul must have gotten out and was playing somewhere around the pigsty. Again, this was his home. For all intents and purposes, this was his backyard. I mean, I remember my backyard as a kid. I'm sure everybody watching remembers theirs too. It's a level of safety. You're in the boundary of your home. And so Margaret proceeded to look around the truck. After a few minutes and Paul was nowhere to be found, Margaret started to scream, screaming Paul's name so loud that the other family members back at the family farmhouse could hear her. They quickly rushed out to the truck and helped her try to locate little eight-year-old Paul. After the family had zero luck finding Paul, they decided to contact the authorities. The police quickly came out to the farm. This time, the police were a little bit more worried. Again, this was the fourth supposed disappearance in this particular area. And seeing that the other three people had yet to be found, Needless to say, the police were concerned. So concerned that they ended up getting bloodhounds to try to track the whereabouts of Paul. We're used to this nowadays. Dogs are used a lot in police services. They brought the bloodhounds up to the passenger side of the truck so the bloodhounds could locate Paul's scent. The bloodhounds immediately went in a straight line all the way to the end of the property at an intersection where they stopped. According to the smells of the bloodhound, little Paul had gotten out of the car and walked all the way to the road where he vanished. Now what's interesting is that the entrance to the family farm where little Paul's scent disappears is close to the entrance of the long trail. The same trail where the other three people had vanished. Something also interesting to note is that little Paul had on a very bright red jacket. Paula Weldon, our very first case we looked at here on the Bennington Triangle, also had on a bright red jacket. Now little Paul Jepson was never heard from again. His body never surfaced. No one ever saw him. He just simply vanished like the three before him. Now again, because these cases are so old, a lot of details are missing. And so for my research, I listened to multiple accounts of each story to see if anybody else had a piece of the puzzle that I seemed to be missing. One of the people I listened to was a YouTube channel here called Bedtime Stories. And so I have to credit Bedtime Stories for pointing out all the similarities between these first four disappearances. The first similarity again is that they all vanished in the same area, on or very close to the Long Trail, a trail where hikers still today hike. Another similarity is that all four of these cases happened in winter, not only in the winter time, but in the evening in dusk, in twilight. We also know that with each of these cases, there were people literally around the victim when they vanished. So how peculiar is it that all four of these people vanished with another human being right there? Now, a lot of people have thought that maybe this was the work of a serial However, it doesn't appear to be that way because none of these victims are the same age nor the same gender. And if you know anything about the psychology of serial you know that they typically pick the same type of person. In fact, the only similarities between these victims is their race. Beyond that, we had Minnie Rivers, who was in his 70s. We had Paula Jean Weldon, who was 18. And of course, we had James Tedford, who was an elderly man who vanished on a bus driving past the area. And I say all four of the cases had this similarity. The fifth case, which we're going to cover next week, holds a lot of these same similarities as well, except for one difference. In the fifth case, the body was eventually discovered. 
All right, you guys, thank you so much for sitting through this part four of this breakdown of the Bennington Triangle on our series, Mystery Monday. Of course, you guys know once we finish up all these cases, I do tend on doing a deep dive back into all these cases with our friend Tarot by Janine to see if the cards can give us any more information about these victims. After we leave the Bennington Triangle, I am going to cover some other cases of missing people in national parks. After all, the Bennington Triangle is located in a national park. Now, some of the most recent cases have way more details, and so it's going to make this deep dive a little bit more thorough. Because these particular Bennington cases are old, we are limited by what we factually have. We also have to remember that the forensic science wasn't around back then. There was really no DNA testing. So there probably was a lot that the authorities missed just because of the time period that these incidents happened. But with that being said, I personally do believe that these vanishings are of the spiritual kind and not necessarily of the human kind. I do believe that humans were involved, but they were involved because of some type of portal that might exist in this area. However, because we have no physical proof of that, this is all just my speculation. But again, I would love to hear your opinions down in the comment section below. I hope that you're having a fantastic week. Know the best is yet to come. We will get through this. Hang in there and have a wonderful, wonderful day.